Good morning. Today we're looking at Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Nebuchadnezzar is deeply troubled. So troubled that he keeps waking up in the middle of the night and can't sleep. The idea of this passage is that God sometimes allows humans, however powerful, to discover how bankrupt their belief systems are, the things that they value, the things that they trust, they all start to fall apart. Nebuchadnezzar's great wealth and power are worthless in determining the meaning of his dreams. Babylon's wise men, the people of other gods, cannot answer the king, and they have no help. But a young Daniel, a mere teenager, who has a heart for God, is given the opportunity to bring light into a dark and hopeless situation. It's desperate. People are going to die. And the light of God comes into light. Some of you may not remember back in June of 1997, there was a man in Iraq named Saddam Hussein. And Saddam Hussein lived in the country of Iraq, ruled it, and was obsessed with power. And he had illusions that he was a reincarnation or some kind of descendant of the great king Nebuchadnezzar. He began rebuilding Babylon. And he put in bricks that mentioned himself. It said, in the era of President Saddam Hussein, the president of Iraq, God preserve him, who rebuilt Babylon as protector of the great Iraq and the builder of civilization. See, like Nebuchadnezzar, he was obsessed with power. And we will learn more about Nebuchadnezzar and his quest for power. But today, people still have anxiety dreams that wake them up. And they're characterized by feelings of unease, distress, apprehension when the dreamer awakes. And that you can be traumatized by a dream. And today we are looking at Nebuchadnezzar and how he was traumatized by his dreams, his lengthy, bizarre, and violent imagery of these dreams. But because Daniel made a decision early in life, the basic decision that each of us have to make, whether we will pursue good or pursue evil. Daniel pursued good, and he would not let his heart 
and his life be compromised. Here we see in Daniel chapter 1, 2, verse 1, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more, they replied, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So tell me, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it. The astrologers, answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods and they don't live among humans. This made the king angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death, the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Daniel chapter 2 is broken up into three parts. We're looking at the first part today, verses 1 through 16. The king has set the stage by wanting an interpretation of the dream and framing it with consequences. The next section is 17 to 30, which is the the core, the guts of this passage. And then the third part of this message is 31 to 49. The actual dream and its interpretation. These first 16 verses we're going to look at as one, the announcement of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, verses 1 through 4 then the contentious nature of the conflict between the wise men, 
the advisors of the king and his sages, and then the death sentence for all the wise men. This takes place at Nebuchadnezzar's second year while he was trying to gain control over this new kingdom with all of the challenges that he faced. As you recall, I mentioned when we started, Daniel, that the Assyrian Empire ruled the whole Mesopotamian Valley, which is now Iraq, all the way down to the Gulf from about 900 to 600 BC. And it fell to the combined forces of the Babylonians and the Medes under Nebuchadnezzar, which was the father of Nebuchadnezzar. And after his death, his son established Babylon as the new capital. Within the year, he had subjugated Jerusalem and Jehoiakim, and now we are looking at this dream. See, Nebuchadnezzar is consolidated a new empire, and there are many forces. He is consumed with power. He is consumed with unsurety. He wants to hold on to it. But there are so many forces that are trying to pull it apart. And he's having this recurring dream. And he wakes up and he can't sleep and he's angry and he's troubled. These are recurring dreams or visions that keep striking at the mind and the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar. It's insomnia. A lot of people today have insomnia because different things worry them. There are all kinds of things that people worry about. What am I going to do this year? What am I going to do next year? How am I going to handle high school? How am I going to handle college? How am I going to handle middle age? And now with COVID, will I live? Who will I know that will die? This was especially troubling in the formative years of this king's new reign. So the king summoned the people that he relied upon that his culture and his religion told him to rely upon. The astrologers, the sorcerers, the diviners, the wise men, and Daniel. And these astrologers had no clue as to determining what the dream was. If he had told them the dream, they would have, they had books on what dreams mean. But he was asking something that no one has ever asked. The Egyptians had dream interpretation books that we have found. They exist to this day. And the explanation of certain objects in dreams. Freud did the same thing. Countless others try to understand dreams. But we see here that only God is able to do this. They don't even begin to to come up with a dream. They're afraid for their lives. So they sit and they cower. I have had a dream, and I want to know what it means. 
these Chaldeans, these astrologers, these wise men, these are the sorts of men that came to the birth of Christ, the Magi. And they are very respectful because they know that Nebuchadnezzar is harsh and brutal. This whole society is harsh and brutal. May the king live forever. But yet this is what the king had firmly decided. He uses an Aramaic word, Azda, a Persian loan word meaning firm and certain. It's not going to change. They were threatening them, he was threatening them with dismemberment. This is a common way that the Babylonian Nebuchadnezzar's and Nebuchadnezzar's enemies were treated. They were brought before them and sometimes they would just cut off the hands and the feet in front of him and just dismember them. That's what the, the sentence here of King Nebuchadnezzar is. The king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have so firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, you will be cut to pieces and your houses turned to rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream. But they could not tell him the dream, because there is no man on earth that could do so. We see that Nebuchadnezzar has done this to others in the past. Second Kings 25, 6 through 7, Jeremiah 29, 21 through 22. But now it's happening here. In 2 Kings, it says, He was taken to the king of Babylon at Rebla, where sentence was pronounced on him. They killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and then they put out his eyes, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. See, that is the kind of brutality that occurred in this time in human history. Human history is full of atrocious treatment of other individuals. England in the 1500s was just horrific. It's not any particular culture. It's what humans can do to each other. See, Nebuchadnezzar saw them as trying to play for time and he wanted an immediate answer. He thought they were committing treason, lies invented with evil motives. But they said that no one can do this. They don't appeal to their gods because they know their gods won't answer them. There is no way that you're going to get an answer from these gods of the Babylonians or the Assyrians or the Akkadians. Gods do not live among humans. What they're saying is we're here all alone. There is no way that we can get help. See, that's the thing that is so unique about Yahweh, the God who is, the God who is with us. The king ordered the execution, but Daniel spoke to him with wisdom. This is a major lesson right here. How we function how we respond in crisis can make all the difference in the world. Instead of losing it, screaming and running and for cover, 
Daniel remain calm. And as it says in Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. He literally answered him with good taste and wisdom. And that is a lesson for you and I. When we are under pressure, how we answer, how we deal with things, reveals our relationship with God. Daniel then went to the king and asked for time. Let me go and find out from God. Give me some time to be able to answer this. I just found out. Please. That's what Daniel did. He had such a maturity as a teenager to respond with cool, calm reason. We see three truths about God buried here in this passage of these first 16 verses. Without a reliable knowledge of the true God, even though you're wealthy and even though you're powerful, it's not going to give you any understanding of life. And without first-hand personal knowledge of God. We're in darkness and we're distant. And we can't function in life. So you and I need to have a relationship with God so we can go to him and talk to him and he hears us and he responds to us. It's not a matter of having the right thinking, reading the right book. It's about having a relationship with God. Without reliable knowledge of God, without personal knowledge of God, no matter how wise we think we are, we're in darkness. In the desperate situations that we encounter in life, it's when we are able to go to God and speak true wisdom. That's what people need. If you haven't noticed, there are a lot of people in our world today who are in darkness. They don't know which side is up. They have no answers to life. and they don't know where to begin. They don't go to God. Their religious faith is bankrupt. It's either embedded in false religion or sometimes it's false understanding of what God wants from them. It's a matter of works instead of grace. God can do this for somebody else, but he won't do it for me. Sometimes people are caught up in secular philosophy. But nothing matters unless you have a clear and personal relationship with God. That's what will sustain you. That's what will help you through the dark periods of life. And we will be encountering opportunities as Daniel did in the dark world. And without a personal knowledge of God, we're going to be of no earthly good. Sometimes people think that if they are in power or in charge or they have control of the situation, they can make a big difference. There was a man that some of you remember, 
Chuck Colson, who was Nixon's hatchet man. And he thought he was in control. He was in control until he lost control and went to jail. And he discovered that it's only a personal relationship with God, not political power and authority, that really gets us through life. Only, the only solution was a change of his heart when he realized that most of everything that he had done was for him, for his control, his power. It wasn't for God. And then God used him to reach other people, to bring light into their life. And that organization still exists today, Prison Fellowship, bringing light and discernment and the truth to people and brokenness. When things are dark, it also gives us an opportunity to respond with light. Corey Tenbu, countless others. Some of you have seen Schindler's List. It's a compelling film where Oscar Schindler helped bring a large number of young people and old people out of the Nazi control, freed them from death. He lamented in his life, I could have got more out if I had made more money. Why did I keep the car? Even though he has been responsible for rescuing 1,100 children, his mind wasn't completely satisfied because he wanted to do more. Some of you remember 9-11. Some of you remember Pearl Harbor. Some of you remember Katrina. And all of you remember COVID-19. But in times of darkness, it's our time to share the light. As Christians, we have the unique opportunity to be the light of Christ in the world of darkness, which is longing for light. Matthew 5, 14. See, God came to a weak and powerless king who lacked wisdom and understanding by the world's standards and used his servant Daniel to bring light. Paul reminds us that the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. God chooses to demonstrate his almighty power in his unfathomable wisdom to a man who was inebriated with his own lust and power and wisdom in order to show how weak and how foolish he really is. This is just the first glimpse into the heart and mind of Nebuchadnezzar. More will follow. This is revealing the trouble, the anxiety, the strife, the quest for power that these dreams are causing in his life. And if you don't know the, the dream, you will see why in the following weeks. Paul asks, who among men knows the thoughts 
of a man except a man's spirit within him. See, nobody knows the thoughts and the struggles that each of you have. But God, if you go to him, will be there to help you and sustain you. There really is nowhere else. Turn to God and look for opportunities to be light in this dark world as Daniel did. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you gave Daniel wisdom, that you gave him tact, that you gave him insight because he sought it from you. Pray, Lord, that we might seek, seek your light and your answers to the dark situations that we find ourselves in today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.